Hey, John. Uh, so we have, now we have John Bodie, um, the vice president of um, of the Bold Pros, and we're happy to have him uh, here. So um, he's going to talk to us about mold remediation and testing. So thank you, John. All right. Thanks, Matt. Ken, how's the audio? Can you hear me okay? Hey, Matt, I'm not sure if you can hear on the audio. Okay, All right, perfect, thank you. Well, <laughs> good afternoon, I tell you. Uh, bat and clean up uh, on a Saturday afternoon or evening and then uh, following uh, Dr. Brewer, that's that's certainly a tall order, but I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share with you. Um, my name is John Bodie. We're gonna cover um, uh, assessments and remediation for those with environmental illness. Uh, I am a licensed uh, inspector uh, by the state of Florida uh, for mold as well as mold remediation. I hold uh, certificates uh, in environmental sanitization, uh, mold and uh, moisture inspection, as well as mold remediation. Uh, for the last decade, we've had the privilege of uh, helping those with environmental illness and try to be a part of uh, the solution as they're on their road to recovery. Um, I'm the founder of the Mold Pros, uh, Vice President, as Matt had mentioned. Uh, we're a national environmental assessment and remediation company based here in South Florida. Also the founder and Vice President of Natural Enzyme Technologies, which is a company that produces eco-friendly products used in the remediation process. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hooper and uh, Dr. Pratt Hyatt for bringing us together on this fantastic event. Um, I think it's uh, really um, fantastic that we get to share and learn from some of the giants in our field. And like I said, it's an honor to be here. Uh, before I get started, I also want to thank uh, Diane, my business partner, my girlfriend, my bride of 33 years. Uh, we left our cushy, well-paying corporate jobs to start an environmental company. She looked me in the eye and she said, of all the things to get passionate about, you picked mold. Really? Mold? And uh, I guess that does seem a little odd. Uh, but it set us off on our adventure together, and it's been a gratifying journey. Uh, she's certainly brilliant, uh, empathetic, long-suffering, and uh, can ask for a better partner. All right, topics we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to cover an overview of fungi from an indoor environmental professional uh, or IEP perspective. Um, we'll talk about assessing structures for those with environmental illness. Um, including a different sampling types. I know we've covered that a little bit. Uh, Dr. Johnson mentioned it during his presentation. Uh, that's one of the questions I'm most frequently asked. We'll also cover uh, mold remediations and uh, we'll touch on why traditional remediation is often insufficient for those with environmental illness. Uh, we'll also talk about DYI remediations. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of projects can be handled by a homeowner uh, as long as uh, uh, you know, the scope is within their ability and uh, certainly uh, the health is taken into consideration. Um, we'll also recommend some products that we, that, uh, we use during re uh, remediations um, that are a little more eco-friendly as well. And uh, hopefully we'll have some time for a Q&A. Uh, during the course of the presentation, I'm going to refer to several studies and guidelines today um, and happy to make those available to you. Uh, just drop me a line or a chat and uh, we'll get those over to you. Uh, afterwards. So I teach a class on mold assessment and remediation and uh, we've dubbed this slide the world's most important slide. Um, we actually uh, print out copies and hand it to our clients to help them better understand the process as well as uh, how and what needs to be treated. Um, understanding the fundal life cycle is really the first step when either investigating or solving issues within a structure. Um, if we start at the very beginning, molds need three things to thrive. And uh, Dr. Pratt Hyatt touched on this a little bit uh, during his opening presentation when he mentioned uh, modern building techniques have changed and the shift away from lathe and plaster to drywall. So the first thing that uh, molds need uh, is a complex carbon compound as a food source. Uh, molds are like us, uh, they love carbs and sugars, and the higher the sugar content, the greater fungal competition and the quicker the growth. Um, the second thing that molds need is sufficient moisture and the amount of moisture dependent uh, is dependent upon the species um, and of course like all living things um, fungi need oxygen to thrive um, if we take a look at the very top portion here we'll have whoops let me get back here uh, 
There we go. And Dr. Brewer mentioned this as well. Um, what we have, we have a spore. When it germinates, we're going to have uh, hyphal fragments or hyphae that uh, come from the spore. Um, and this hyphal growth, which we'll see on the next slide, and Dr. Brewer alluded to, uh, these hyphal fragments can carry secondary metabolites uh, throughout a structure. Uh, and this hyphal growth uh, obviously is, can be much smaller than a mold spore. So when we see suspected microbial growth in a building, uh, that's the hyphal or mycelial structure that we're looking at. And uh, we should never have growth inside of a home. And we'll talk about uh, why addressing hyphal fragments and biomass is critically important on the next slide. Uh, here we have spore formations. And uh, fungi go through sporulation cycles. Xerophilic fungi typically have airborne sporulation cycles. Uh, hydrophilic fungi often distribute their spores via water, uh, insects, or rodents. Um, as I am talking with clients, I usually use the uh, dandelion uh, head analogy when explaining how spores can become aerosolized and spread throughout a structure. Then we have these spores will settle right down here at the bottom. And uh, of course, this is invisible to the naked eye. Uh, they land on desktops and on clothes and headboards and nightstands and uh, they oftentimes get sucked into the HVAC system, and uh, we know that spores are the fruiting bodies on GI, and they're pretty small, typically 0.3 to 0.25 microns, and they can get everywhere. Then these settled spores will typically uh, land on a substrate that is going to be the food source. When they get sufficient moisture, that's when they germinate. So... Um, when the, the spore actually germinates, it, it fragments the shell of the spore, also known as a biomass. And I think Dr. Brewer mentioned that a little bit as well. Um, and as it uh, grows, um, it, it sends out a filamentous um, hyphal fragment right here or hyphal structure. And then it's, the whole thing repeats and goes all over again. So when we're talking about mold remediation, we should be addressing this the hyphal structure, we're going to address the spore formations, and we also need to address settled spores as well. Um, post remediation, it's critical that we manage the moisture aspect of it because you will have settled spores inside of a structure. There's no way to get them completely out, and we're always going to get recontamination whenever we have egress into the structure. So, this next slide. Uh, was a 2009 study by Christian Fogg Nelson addressing the amount of fine particulate matter, which again is much smaller than a mold spore, which is released inside of a building. It states that there can be a 300 fold um, concentration of hyphal fragments and biomass released than the actual uh, counts of mold spores. And this is why PCR testing can be such a valuable tool uh, when understanding the fungal ecology of a building. It picks up on the finer particulate matter that, that maybe direct microscopic analysis may miss. Uh, the study further states that the worst case scenario for a homeowner is produced by consecutive episodes of water damage that promote fungal growth, that vegetative growth uh, that we saw on the very top of that last slide, and mycotoxin synthesis, followed by drier conditions that facilitate the liberation of spores and hyphal fragments. And we can think of a, a bathroom where perhaps an exhaust fan is undersized or isn't being used, and you have maybe a, a child or a teenager that takes that 30-minute hot, steamy shower. Um, and why that's the worst-case scenario for a homeowner, that is absolutely the best-case scenario for, uh, for fungi. And the last bullet talks about metabolic production is influenced by environmental factors. And I think that's really key uh, in understanding that uh, temperature, moisture, food source, and other microorganisms. I think uh, Dr. Jill Krista mentioned uh, a little bit of that soup, the other bacteria, other fungi, which uh, uh, contribute to environmental factors and whether a fungi produces mycotoxins or not. So just because we have Stachybacter chartrum doesn't always mean that we're going to have trichothecenes being produced. So next slide is uh, I'm going to talk about water damaged buildings and maybe try to shape our thinking a little bit to um, moisture affected buildings. As inspectors, we're trained to look for water damaged buildings or WDBs. You'll see it throughout most presentations. And we're taught to look for water staining or buckling sheet rock or nails popping and those sorts of things. 
and we have all kinds of expensive equipment such as infrared thermal cameras or uh, infrared moisture meters, boroscopes, hygrometers, uh, all the tools needed to find uh, those water leaks. And it's important for us to do that. Um, and it's important for us to use those tools uh, appropriately. Um, but oftentimes we'll have really moldy homes that don't have any water leaks at all or any visible water damage. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So maybe we need to start thinking not just in terms of water damaged buildings, but also start thinking in terms of moisture affected buildings uh, when we're inspecting. And the reason for that is growing conditions for xerophilic fungi and hydrophilic fungi can be vastly different. Uh, in a study published by the American Society for Microbiology, the most dominant uh, fungal species in the study was, of water damaged buildings was actually Aspergillus versicolor. It was in about 94% of the homes, if I recall correctly. And that's a fungi that can thrive with only high humidity. It doesn't really require water damage, um, although it'll take it if, if it has that much moisture. So, um, water damage or water leaks is not required to have a major fungal or even uh, a major mycotoxin exposure. I was in a home a few weeks ago for a client that was chronically ill. Uh, her urine environmental uh, mycotoxin testing confirmed elevations of aflatoxins as well as ochratoxin A. And she had had two recent remediations to address water leaks in two bathrooms. Uh, but she wasn't getting any better, and uh, we were called out to try to find out what the problem was. Uh, her house was pretty large, um, and she was insistent that um, she had addressed the water damage issues and that she couldn't possibly have a problem because all the water leaks were fixed. Ironically, she actually uh, owned an environmental company that dealt primarily with lead and asbestos. Uh, it wasn't, uh, mold wasn't really a, a focus for them, but she had some idea of how this stuff worked. Um, and during our inspection, we were able to show her that she actually had aspergillus and penicillium growth, vegetative growth underneath uh, tables. And we confirmed that growth by surface sampling, did a tape sample. Um, we were also able to show her that she had suspected microbial growth throughout the home, including on cabinet doors, on uh, bedroom doors, uh, on the decking and floor joists in the basement, all areas without uh, water leaks. And uh, the issue was determined to be actually just elevated humidity. So understanding the fungal ecology and the moisture requirements for fungal growth and food sources, uh, I think is pretty important. Um, and we'll talk a little bit on the next slide about xerophilic fungi. So we can categorize uh, fungi into two groups, uh, xerophilic fungi and hydrophilic fungi. And we'll start with xerophilics. Uh, so what is xerophilic fungi? Um, the root word uh, is uh, Greek, uh, xeros for dry and phylos for loving. So essentially they're dry loving uh, molds. Um, xerophiles are organisms that can grow and reproduce in conditions with low availability of water, uh, also known as water activity. Um, water activity from an IEP standpoint is measured as humidity above a substance relative to, to the humidity above uh, pure water. Uh, most people, including most IEPs, don't measure water activity. So for the rest of the presentation, we'll talk in terms of relative humidity. There was a 1996 study which identified buildings as quote unquote new man-made ecosystems where, as in other environments, a limited number of fungal species will dominate, depending upon humidity and nu nutrient availability. Um, so humidity levels and food source are really key inside the structure. The EPA and their guidance uh, for mold remediation recommends maintaining relative humidity levels at 30% to 50% to uh, limit fungal growth inside of a structure. And xerophilic molds typically produce uh, really light airborne spores, which are easily distributed throughout the home, um, which is all the more reason why we're inspecting to uh, make sure that we check out HVAC systems uh, and make sure that on the remediation side, those systems get treated. Um, xerophilic fungi are also very fast growers. Uh, there's a study that, that came out that shows that once we have xerophilic mold growth, that with sufficient moisture, we can actually have vegetative growth in less than 60 minutes. So when we think of uh, perhaps uh, cladosporium or 
what folks will call mildew growing in the shower grout lines, and they'll treat it with sodium hypochlorite or bleach or uh, something along that those lines, and they um, they treat and clean the top of the uh, of the surfaces, but they don't get all the hyphae out of the mildew or the the grout lines, and that mold just comes right back magically days later. Very much the same case there. We can further categorize xerophilic molds into two subgroups, uh, xerophilic and extremely xerophilic. So extremely, xero, uh, extremely xerophilic, xerophilic fungi, they're kind of the first responders to a moisture event. Um, extremely xerophilic molds uh, can be active, in other words, not dormant, at very low water activity levels, actually 0.45 uh, and higher. So molds that are classified as extremely xerophilic include Aspergillus species, Penicillium species, Willemia, and some others. And again, a study of 5,000 water damaged uh, buildings revealed uh, Aspergillus uh, was the most dominant uh, species uh, present, like I said, over 90% of the structures. Regular xerophilic fungi, um, those are kind of, we can think of those as secondary responders. These show up after Aspergillus and Penicillium and they require a little bit more moisture to thrive. Um, and this group would include uh, fungi such as Altenaria or uh, Cladosporium, uh, Foma or Eulocladium species. A uh, 2003 paper uh, written by Nelson uh, indicates that these fungi are able to thrive under conditions where marked changes in humidity occur throughout the day or during the day. So it, it's, they can be actually that sensitive and grow with, with not that much moisture. It's important to note that xerophilic molds will thrive with more moisture. They'll take it if you give it to them. They just don't require it. Then we have hydrophilic fungi. Uh, again, uh, water loving uh, from the Greek word hydros and uh, phyllos mini loving. Um, these molds are tertiary uh, fungi. So these show up uh, a little bit later. Uh, they're slower growers. Um, and it's not uncommon when we have a water event, say, for example, a burst pipe that causes mold growth on drywall. Uh, the first responders are going to be Aspergillus or Penicillium. Uh, they'll get there first. Then after a few days, when Stachybotrys will grow, we'll actually see um, the black spot occur, and you'll see the white Aspergillus or lighter colored Aspergillus get pushed to the edges as the Stachybotrys will displace it. So uh, that's not that uncommon. Um, different types of hydrophilic molds uh, include, uh, of course, Catomium species, uh, Stachybotra species. We'll oftentimes see those together. And their uh, water activity is, is going to be really closer to that 1% water activity. Um, I think Dr. Jill mentioned um, bacteria and endotoxins uh, during her presentation. Um, bacteria thrive about the same water activity levels as uh, hydrophilic molds. So when we have those water events, not just dry, you know, elevated humidity where dry loving molds kick in, but when we have those water events, that's oftentimes where we'll see bacterial growth as well. Um, and again, we mentioned earlier, hydrophilics, uh, they're oftentimes, uh, their spores are spread by water, insects, and rodents. It doesn't oftentimes aerosolize. Um, Stacky will aerosolize a little bit if it becomes disturbed uh, through the remediation process. Perhaps uh, Catomium will aerosolize uh, a little bit uh, as well, but uh, in general, not nearly to the level that our xerophilic friends will, uh, will aerosolize. So let's talk a little bit about assessing structures for those with environmental uh, illness. Uh, so now we have a little bit better understanding of some of the growing conditions. Uh, the, next assess, uh, the next step is to obtain a really comprehensive assessment of the structure. Um, if you only take away a bullet point or two from this evening's presentation or discussion, I hope you take away this one. Find a qualified IEP that understands environmental illness and is able to provide refer references from other healthcare providers. Um, they should be able to test for more than just molds. I think Dr. Johnson uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Krista mentioned earlier that you know they should be able to perform multiple types of tests, not not just spore traps or air sampling, but also uh, they should be able to perform uh, VOC or vaults or organic compound testing. Uh, they should understand mycotoxins. They should be able to perform bacterial testing or endotoxin testing. 
Um, and they certainly should be uh, certified or and licensed at, at a minimum. Um, it's important, and I tell all of our folks that, that work for us that, you know, it's as good as the treatment that a patient receives from their healthcare provider, the recovery is going to suffer if we don't. Don't, don't uh, assess the property well. If we don't remediate the property well, uh, that's going to be a whole different outcome for the patient. And a false negative or a poor assessment um, can be really frustrating and an expensive journey for a patient to go down. It's almost worse than not having any data at all. Um, the state of Florida requires licensing. It's one of a few states that, that actually have licensure for mold assessment and mold remediation. And we send all of our folks uh, through in our Florida office to get licensed. And uh, one of my employees asked the state instructor, well, hey, what about mycotoxins? Are we going to talk about that? And the instructor for the state said, you don't really need to worry about mycotoxins. It's not that big a deal, which is kind of scary. So find an IEP that is mold literate. Uh, and understands environmental health. So um, moving on to the assessment process, uh, our, it really should begin, and hopefully you do some sort of interviews with your patients um, with understanding the, the home and the history. So we ask such questions as, are you better when you're away from the home than when you're in the home? Um, are there areas of your home that you're more symptomatic than others? Or are there areas of the home where you sense odors and uh, perhaps areas where those odors are stronger? We always want to know if they're under a doctor's care. Uh, we do work for about 40 or 50 docs nationwide, and uh, that's important information for us to have. We also want to understand the history of the property. Have you had water damage in the past? Uh, do you have um, any current issues that you're dealing with or any prior uh, testing or any prior remediations? We, all, we want to understand that information. Um, so that's pretty important. We oftentimes will see, uh, receive lab results from our, our clients, whether that's a ERMI test or a Hurts Me Too or any other testing may be performed by a, another uh, inspector. And so we want to understand, okay, exactly. Uh, tell me where you tested. Um, uh, tell me when you tested. Let's, let's go over the results. Can you send those over to me? Um, oftentimes we have uh, homeowners who may um, – present biased data by sampling incorrectly. For example, for a long period of time, everybody was sampling underneath the refrigerator. And um, that probably isn't the fungal ecology in the home. Uh, it's a great place to get a lot of dust, but it's really not indicative of what the inhalation risk is. So uh, once we have that, that data, we'll walk that through the customer and we'll determine if additional sampling is, is required or not uh, based on the inspection. So it's important, and if you, we have any IEPs, and I know there's a couple of them that's on here, some folks that I know that do a great job, but uh, laboratory data tells us the what. The inspection should tell us the where and the why. That's what we're after. And identification of the source or sources is the primary objective of any home assessment. Um, our approach, whenever we uh, take a look at a structure, we call it the three M's. We approach it from a moisture, uh, then a mold, and then a mycotoxin uh, perspective. And we do it exactly in that order. And a, and a good inspection will typically start with the exterior. Uh, your IEP should check for potential moisture issues such as improper downspouts or gutters um, that are, are, are not effective, improper draining or negative slope going into the structure, um, any roofing issues, curling shingles, um, flashings that's missing around chimneys or, or uh, any other flashing issues, um, any penetrations, open penetrations into the structure. Those are all important things to note. Um, the first picture that we have on here actually is a infrared thermal image. And we use, uh, and most, most good IEPs do, we we'll use infrared uh, thermography to scan a property. Um, it can be really helpful in finding hidden moisture issues that are not visible with the naked eye. This particular picture was actually underneath a tiled balcony and there were hairline cracks in the mortar joints, which caused that amount of damage. Uh, barely visible when looking up from below, um, but once the ceiling was removed, it was filled with stachybotrys. 
And um, the picture on the bottom, of course, is open penetrations where homeowner or someone's come back in and tried to cock it, but we still have open penetrations inside the structure. So once you're complete with an exterior inspection, you move into the interior. And this is really important, and it's where a lot of inspectors um, have an opportunity to do a better job, if that's diplomatically put, is we look at the structure, but also look at the contents. Um, look for any anomalies such as discoloration, HESS levels, uh, water staining. Uh, inspect the sheetrock uh, surrounding the AC supplies. And look at the uh, AC supplies themselves. Um, obviously looking for water intrusions, whether that's either chronic or acute. Uh, you know, due to storm damage, roofing issues, drainage problems, et cetera. Uh, and as we saw on the last slide, leaks uh, can be pinhole leaks that are really difficult to find. And that's where that equipment really, really helps out. Some of the best tools that we have uh, as an inspector is a high lumen flashlight or maybe a black light and your nose and your eyes. Um, that's, those are the best tools uh, and, and spend a lot of time uh, looking at a structure. Um, you know, we're typically on our backs looking underneath uh, dining tables. We're pulling away nightstands. Um, the photo up above, um, this is from an actual project. Again, just a few weeks ago, we don't have to go very far to, uh, to get these examples. We were the third inspection company to look at this property. The first inspector came in and took air samples and found out that we have penicillin and aspergillus, um, pretty high elevations. Uh, it was a Florida property, and then we can we can grow xerophilic molds like nobody's business down here. Um, and then they went back and had the HVAC treated and serviced and uh, for molds because they figured that's where the issue was. Well, they came back to do the post test, and it failed miserably. It was just as high as the initial test. So we were brought in to try to figure out what the issue was. And during our inspection of the home, um, this is what we found. We had uh, plenty of aspergillus growing on the nightstands and behind the headboard. And then, of course, we can take a look at this um, this hat. And it just has splotches of aspergillus uh, vegetative growth growing all over it. So the structure itself actually wasn't, wasn't bad. It was the contents that um, was supporting the fungal growth. The issue, which oftentimes can be the case, is that the homeowner turned their HVAC system way up to save on electricity bills, uh, which didn't allow the um, HVAC system to pull out the condensation or humidity inside the home. So I don't think they saved a whole lot on the electric bills that, uh, well, they wound up paying a little bit on, on a remediation. And then getting, continuing on with HVAC systems, um, you know, a, good, a good central heat and air system can be the first line of defense um, for protecting a home against uh, fungal elevations. It can also be a conduit for spreading those contaminants throughout a structure. And uh, a good inspection of a home should always include looking at the HVAC system. It's just critical. Uh, HVAC systems, we consider them to be the lungs of the home. Um, take Humid, uh, relative humidity readings uh, throughout the structure, including taking readings coming from the supply vents. Uh, oftentimes we can get compromises in flex duct, which will introduce moisture from the attic into the structure and can cause issues. Once the visual inspection is completed, then develop a sampling strategy uh, for the home to validate your hypothesis. Um, if suspected microbial growth is observed, such as what we saw in the, well, the HVAC, the air handler here, and on the coils, you're going to recommend a surface sample. Uh, I'm a big believer in surface sampling uh, as the goal, as we mentioned during any investigation, is to confirm the source of the contamination. And surface, surface sampling does a great job of doing that. Um, I, I personally believe that surface sampling trumps air sampling. Uh, we do perform both. Uh, and we think that both are necessary and have their roles, but uh, we, we will lean towards surface sampling every time. So collect your environmental samples, uh, and then once you get the results back, a remediation protocol should be uh, developed based upon the visual inspection and the laboratory data. Um, 
And so we'll, you know, we always try to let the science do the, do the talking. So, and we'll talk more on the next slide about different types of sampling that'll help provide those insights. Um, and I'll begin, and I mentioned, hey, if you, if you take away only a couple of bullets, you know, I hope that, that uh, we add this next line to the, another bullet that you take away, is that every sampling type has its strength and, and weakness. Um, and we firmly believe that it's a combination of sampling types that really provide the best insights to the structure. Um, you know, there's a thought that maybe X type of sampling is bad or ineffective, and I would suggest that, you know, each sampling, if, if used properly and uh, analyzed properly, has its proper application and is a data point for certain things. Um, a quality inspector will understand the, the strengths and weaknesses of each test and apply it appropriately. So one of the things I'll encourage you is, is beware of what we call the pump jockeys. And, that, and that's an inspector who just comes in and grabs, you know, two or three air samples and then leaves. It doesn't properly inspect the structure. You know, they, certainly they're inexpensive, but again, you're going to wind up uh, most likely with a false negative, which is pretty expensive for the patient. Um, I always encourage folks that a proper assessment is really pennies on the dollar when compared to a remediation, and it will allow you to right size the remediation. And we'll talk more about that in here in just a little bit. And uh, proper assessment will provide for the best patient outcomes. So we're going to break fungal sampling down into two types of analysis. Direct microscopic exam, uh, which is um, probably one of the most common, right? It's been around for forever, and it's kind of the industry standards. And then we'll talk about MSQ PCR or DNA sampling. Um, also, with sampling, uh, we think it's important to perform mycotoxin sampling. Uh, it's really key, as as others have mentioned, uh, when identifying chronic illness. Uh, Lots of organic compound um, sampling really important for patients that are chemically sensitive. Um, the test, I think it was Dr. Johnson who threw up the PRISM test. I believe that's over 158 chemical compounds, which uh, we as IEPs can, um, can test for, including benzenes, formaldehydes, uh, microbial vault organic compounds, et cetera, and then bacterial and endotoxin testing as well. Let's find out what's really going on inside that structure. And due to time constraints, I know I'm the last uh, presenter on a Saturday afternoon, so um, we'll make sure we stay within our timelines. This is not an exhaustive list of all the pros and cons for every sampling type, but it's it's an overview. And certainly happy to dig deeper uh, and talk more about this, either in a chat or offline or, or even after the conference. Um, I refer to direct microscopic exam as kind of like fishing with the big fishing net. It's a big wide net. We're going to throw it out there and see what, what comes back. Um, direct microscopic exams will include spore traps um, uh, or air testing, what a lot of folks uh, call that. It'll include surface sampling, which will be tape samples. Um, it could be bulk samples. It could be swab samples. Uh, also includes auger plates. And the strength of direct microscopic exams, it's relatively inexpensive when compared to DNA uh, analysis. Um, it's broad sampling, which captures fungi at a genus level as opposed to a species level. Um, when it comes to spore trap, uh, it does allow for an exterior baseline sample uh, to account for any season or geographical variances. You know, what we want to understand is what's commonly found outside of a home. Um, and what's worked its way in through air exchange or what's actually growing inside the structure. And uh, uh, exterior baseline sampling with spore trap will tell you that. Auger plates, um, oftentimes used in a lot of the uh, DYI uh, kits that folks buy from Home Depot, et cetera. And if we really want to understand, uh, are these spores viable or living inside the structure? That's where auger plates uh, come into play. Um, Surface sampling, as we mentioned, tape swabs or bulks, it really helps us pinpoint whenever we see um, uh, suspected microbial growth. The picture above is actually a tape sample off of a pillar uh, on a home that was supposedly clean and been treated and remediated, uh, but actually wound up having uh, surface molds, uh, xerophilic, uh, well, actually aspergillus throughout. The weaknesses of a spore trap. You know, um, xerophilic molds go through sporulation cycles just like uh, flowers go through blooming cycles. And so 
Uh, if we air sample only, we're not going to capture uh, hydrophilic molds like stachybotrys, which don't aerosolize. Um, spore traps do require um, specialized equipment. You need a, a pump uh, in order to sample. And uh, as we mentioned, direct microscopic exam doesn't identify at the species level, so we won't have that data. Uh, it's only at the genus level. And then you can also have particulate crowding on a lab slide where when there's a lot of debris, like in a crawl space or an attic or, or sometimes in a basement, or get a lot of particulate matter on the slide, which includes um, the mold that's, that's there, the spores that are there, and, and they, it can't be counted. So you get a negative bias. And then um, auger plates, um, which, as I mentioned, are helpful for understanding if we have viable spores, uh, they're really biased towards xerophilic molds. Um, yeah, they're not going to capture those hydrophilics either. Um, and also, all molds don't really culture that well, uh, stacky being one of them. Then we'll get into um, MSQ-PCR. Uh, so um, PCR analysis is um, more like hunting as opposed to net fishing. So it's only going to identify the species for which the DNA probes are, are plugged in. Uh, I'll give you a great example. The ERMI test has 10 species of aspergillus. Uh, there's over about 185 species of aspergillus. So the ERMI, uh, which is a fairly expansive list of uh, aspergillus species, um, is only about 5%. So it's not, not that much. Uh, but I am a big proponent of PCR analysis. Um, MSQ-PCR stands for Mold Specific Quantitative Polymerase Chain Reaction. Um, DNA is a whole lot easier to say, and so we'll run with that. But uh, the DNA testing identifies uh, not only the spores, but also identifies the biomass, which is the shell of that spore, as well as hyphal fragments. Uh, it's certainly a, a lot more sensitive test uh, than compared to uh, DME or direct microscopic exam. Um, and some tests are pretty easy for the consumers to perform on their own without an IEP coming out. Um, and it does identify uh, pathogenic or uh, highly uh, allergenic fungal species. Uh, weaknesses, again, it's going to be narrow. It's a narrow test, but a deeper test. It's only going to identify what's on there. Um, and it can be prone to sampling bias, as we mentioned. A lot of folks sampling underneath. They're looking for underneath refrigerators. They're looking for really dusty spots, which um, uh, provide that, that sampling bias. Um, Dust samples, like for an ERMI test or a Hurts Me Too, et cetera, it doesn't really take into consideration the normal fungal ecology of the location. And so you can um, wind up being in, for example, Florida and rainy season, which we're in now. Um, it's just a lot more moldy outside, so that's going to show up on the indoor samples. Uh, common um, uh, PCR test, we have the ERMI, which most of us are familiar with, uh, 36 species divided in, into two groups. There's an ARMI test, uh, which is uh, 13 species. Uh, it's just more refined. Of course, the Hurts Me Too, which is a scoring model uh, based on uh, five uh, species of, uh, uh, of fungi. Uh, I think uh, we have Versicolor, Penicilloides, Stachy, Willemia, and Catomium. And then uh, there is a airborne DNA test called a molecular entrapment or MTRAP, which is kind of like a hybrid between um, spore trap testing, and it does get an exterior baseline, as well as uh, uh, that DNA level sampling. I think it's a really strong test. And then we have the EMA test, which, of course, has the uh, 10 uh, species uh, PCR, um, as well as uh, the mycotoxin panel. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the EMA. Um, I'm oftentimes asked by homeowners, you know, they have limited funds, hey, if, if, if you just had to do one test in your home, which test would it be? And for me, the answer is an EMA test. And the reason for that is that it really, as I mentioned in the chat earlier, it kind of gives you the best bang for your buck. Uh, it gets down to brass tacks. It tells you, okay, we have these 10 species, which are toxigenic or pathogenic, um, it doesn't provide all the other species like the ERMI does, which may not relate to toxicity at all. And it also tells you if you actually have those toxins. We learned earlier that uh, just because we have toxigenic species doesn't necessarily mean that we have mycotoxins uh, or mycotoxins are being produced. So uh, if I had just one test, it would be the EMA test. 
Um, I think it's a critical data point for assessing structures and vehicles. We test a lot of cars. A lot of, lot of, a lot of folks spend a lot of time in their vehicles. It's amazing um, how much uh, aspergillus uh, and uh, aspergillus related toxins we find there. Um, happy path, we talk about this quite a bit, is that happy path is when we have a patient that has a urinalysis and that urinalysis will show up with aflatoxins or okra toxins. And then the IMA test allows us to go in and test the structure. And that happy path is that we find the exact same uh, mycotoxins or, or, or fungi inside the structure because then we know exactly where that exposure is coming to. So the test really helps us uh, connect the dots. Um, when testing uh, for not just the EMA, but any sort of uh, PCR test, uh, what we recommend is testing from that HVAC filter. It's a great location for that. And uh, the reason for it is that that helps reduce some of that sampling bias we talked about. It also provides uh, better insight to inhalation risk uh, as opposed to uh, things that have settled. Um, it's a great way of, of getting a composite test for the entire structure since all roads lead through that HVAC filter. Uh, and also can help kind of vet out some of the leg legacy or historical contaminants inside of a structure because we typically, hopefully, we um, swap out those HVAC filters every 90 days or, or, or less if it's a one inch filter or every, uh, uh, you know, five to six months if it's a four or five inch filter. So uh, whenever we sample from an HVAC filter, uh, we typically like to sample with unscented electrostatic swiffers for collection. Uh, that's, that's our process. So Now we'll move on uh, for uh, on remediation guidelines. I won't dig in too deep into this, uh, but not every mold remediation needs to be done by a professional mold remediation company. That may surprise you since I own uh, a few a few branches of one, uh, but that's just simply not the case. Uh, and not every budget will allow for it as well. So um, I think uh, as a reference point, we refer folks all the time. We do a lot of consulting for folks who want to do DIY projects, and I think that's the right thing to do. Um, but um, the EPA has some great guidelines and general guidelines for DIY recommendations, and and why the advice may not be 100%. You know, for those with environmental illness, it really is good from a directional standpoint. Um, the above chart shows kind of a, hey, if this, then that decision tree, uh, which uh, a homeowner can find helpful. It'll, uh, it shows a consumer how to uh, treat the items such as books or clothing or paper or carpet, uh, when to vacuum, when to surface treat, uh, when to discard. And uh, I think it's a really good data point. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if anybody would like a copy of this or a link, uh, let me know, and I can certainly uh, – uh, make that available to you to, uh, to pass out to uh, to your patients. Um, I do think it's interesting the EPA does acknowledge the risk of toxic and airborne fungi and uh, why there isn't a specific guideline for treating residential uh, homes. Uh, the EPA's uh, mold remediation in schools and commercial buildings provides guidance for uh, good mold prevention and remediation. Another good source uh, for consumers is the EPA's guide to air cleaners uh, in the home. Uh, really a lot of good information about IAQ machines and uh, uh, as well as HVAC filters. So that's another good resource. Now let's talk about remediations uh, for those with environmental illness, right? So we've, we've, we've understand fungi, we've gone through, we've uh, inspected a home, we've sampled appropriately. Uh, now it's time for the remediation. And this is a, either the third bullet I hope you take away is that remediation should only uh, begin after the causation issue has been resolved. You know, moisture, ventilation, whatever repairs need to be made, et cetera. Uh, you're just wasting money if we go down that path uh, without those being resolved. Um, and mold remediation really equals removal. Uh, it's uh, going to be one or a combination of three things. It's either going to be one, source removal, and that's removal of building materials or personal items which cannot be effectively treated uh, or it just isn't cost effective to treat. Uh, the other is going to be removal through filtration, whether that's uh, vacuums or air scrubbers or negative air machines. Uh, that is part of that equation. 
And the third is going to be removal through surface treatments. And we'll talk a little bit more about enzymes uh, and the roles that enzymes play in that as well. Per the EPA, uh, dead mold is still allergenic and some dead mold has potentially tox uh, is potentially toxic. The use of biocides such as chlorine bleach is not recommended as a routine practice during mold remediation. I'm uh, glad and shocked that the EPA has that guidance. I think it's spot on. Uh, so we want to be careful when using or recommending products that simply kill the fungi, but doesn't remove it. There's no removal component to it. You know, sodium hypochlorite or hydrogen peroxide, um, even botanical products like uh, time-based products can be effective in killing mold. But if it doesn't remove it and leaves dead mold there, then that's not what we're after for those that are have environmental illness. And um, uh, a couple other points. The goal of any remediation is to return the structure to a normal fungal ecology. Um, we oftentimes hear, you know, hey, can you get the, the home? We want it to be mold free. Well, that's not a realistic expectation. As soon as you open up the door, the windows, we have egress. Molds are ubiquitous. They're going to come inside uh, with air exchange. And so um, zero mold is, is not the end game and shouldn't be. Uh, we shouldn't have mold growth after remediation, as we mentioned earlier, but we are going to have settled spores. And then we're going to refer back to the fungal life cycle. Again, I, I mentioned this is our, our world famous slide. I think it's, it's really spot on when it comes to this. As we're trying to figure out the scope of work and what's proper, uh, if we refer back to this, what we want to understand, do we have a settled spore issue? Or do we have fungal growth issues? That's pretty important. Oftentimes we hear from people, they'll call and they'll say, hey, we have this problem. I have mold illness. I've thrown everything away. And now I'd like for you to come out and treat our home or inspect it. And it, it's just heartbreaking uh, to hear that. Uh, we know that the journey for folks with environmental illness, it's, it's financially draining. Uh, it impacts the entire family and the finances. Um, and it can just be devastating. Um, so as we mentioned, molds require complex carbon compounds as a food source. Therefore, certain items such as metal or plastic or ceramic or concrete, et cetera, they don't support hyphal growth. Um, now, there can be growth in the biofilm or dust beds on these items, um, but remediation is really removing the biofilm dust bed and not discarding those items. Um, settled spores can land on upholstered items as we talked about earlier down here. Um, oops, I did that, uh, that advance in unnecessarily again. So settled spores can be treated on upholstered items, uh, clothes, and yes, even carpeting. Um, I am not a big fan of carpeting inside of a home. I don't have it in my home personally. Um, but most carpeting today is made from either polypropylene or nylon or polyester, and it's just not a great food source. Uh, the wooden tack strip, which secures the carpet to the uh, subfloor, now that can be a good food source for mold, uh, but the carpet itself really isn't in, in a lot of cases. Um, my concern with carpet isn't so much as a food source, but it really becomes, uh, does a really great job of being a reservoir for settled spores. And if it's not vacuumed regularly, it just traps all those spores there. And that's, that's the bigger concern for me when it comes to carpeting. But these things can be treated without being discarded when we have settled spore issues. We'll talk a little bit about uh, traditional remediation, um, such as uh, IICRC or New York, uh, State of New York guidelines. Uh, those are the industry standards. Um, when you do a lot of your licensure, uh, you're going to, their uh, licensing bodies are going to refer back to those standards. Um, and their guidelines are what's told to most mold workers. The challenge is that the remediations are typically based upon a mechanical remediation process. It's, it's kind of like they took um, the asbestos remediation document from decades ago and did a word search and where we found the word asbestos and really replaced it with the word mold. Um, you know, asbestos is a mineral that uh, doesn't aerosolize unless it, you know, becomes disturbed and uh, there's appropriate protocols for addressing that. And that translates to some molds as well. 
but uh, molds are a living organism which run through sporulation cycles. And so they're going to sporulate regardless of whether you disturb them or not, especially your xerophilics are going to get aerosolized. So again, why there's certain commonalities between asbestos abatement and mold abatement, there, there are some differences. Um, some things to think about. So um, HEPA filtration is the industry standard when it comes to mold remediation. And, and, and HEPA stands for high, efficient, high efficiency particulate air. Um, and that filtering media, HEPA filtering media is effective, you know, 99.97% down to 0.3 microns. So as we looked at in our world famous slide, we know that, you know, that's really going to be affected down to the spore level. But how do you get that biomass out and uh, the mycotox, or excuse me, the hyphal fragments out or mycotoxins for that matter, which are much smaller, as uh, Dr. Brewer alluded to earlier. Um, so that, that's a great question. Um, the other thing is that we don't want to use a biocide, as we mentioned earlier, that just kills the fungi. We want to remove it. And, um, and unfortunately, a lot of uh, mold remediators don't even understand mycotoxins or that they even exist. So um, a protocol that I would suggest uh, would be more advantageous for those with environmental illness is a bioremediation protocol. And Webster defines bioremediation as the treatment of pollutants or waste, such as in oil spills or contaminated groundwater or, or an industrial process, like mold remediation, by the use of microorganisms to break down undesirable subs, uh, substances. Um, it can use uh, advanced uh, filtration such as extended media filtration, which is much tighter than HEPA. It has a efficiency rating. Um, it's 99.9995% effective down to 0.12 microns. So it does a better job of capturing those fine hyphal fragments the biomass and, and filtering out mycotoxins when, uh, as opposed to, to HEPA. Um, I also recommend a combination of, of removal of contaminated building material, uh, treatments of surfaces and atomizations or uh, air washes, as well as the use of that advanced filtration. So it's a, it's a multi-prong approach to mold remediation, which is, uh, in my opinion, much more effective. Um, and we can think of using uh, uh, a bioremediation process as more of a nature versus nature approach. Um, a lot of our clients are chemically sensitive. And if you come in with a caustic um, um, biocide or, or something along those lines, it really creates issues for those that are chemically sensitive. So we avoid uh, harsh, uh, harsh chemicals or toxic chemicals as well. So uh, when we're uh, keys to a successful remediation, first of all, define the risk. Uh, that's to the occup occupants, the structure, uh, as well as personal items. Um, common uh, questions we receive uh, is, hey, is it safe for me to be in the home or should we move out? Um, you know, that's, that's a health question. As an IEP, we can't answer that. I can tell you that uh, we have elevations, and I can tell you that – um, yeah, we have presence of mycotoxins, et cetera. But since the uh, federal government hasn't given us any sort of uh, acceptable or unacceptable mold level standards, we can't opine on that. Uh, but what we can do is we can help build a protocol to treat the structure and we can build a protocol uh, to treat um, uh, items inside the structure. Uh, we can also uh, help a homeowner decide whether an item should be discarded if it's cost effective to treat or not. And so that's where we come into play. Um, and again, consideration, is it a settled spore issue or is it hyphal growth? Uh, is it cost effective to, to treat? Um, xerophilic uh, mold blooms oftentimes are on the surface and you can surface treat without removing all the drywall. Uh, but if you have situations where you've had water damage and you have hydrophilic molds, then we're going to remove the drywall uh, two feet beyond the mold line. That's a, that's a standard protocol. Um, and, and, of course, uh, a key is going to be making sure that the moisture sources are resolved. So another question we get is, how do you decide whether it's going to be a whole house or a partial remediation? Can I just treat this one area or do we have to treat everything? Um, and I refer back to the data. Uh, and also, is it a mold or a mycotoxin issue or, or maybe both? Uh, if it's a mold issue, um, perhaps it's contained in a certain area. And if so, uh, containments can be built to protect the rest of the structure and the affected area can be treated effectively uh, as, as a spot treatment. 
Um, this is again where good testing and inspection will define the scope of work uh, that's required to be performed. Um, you're going to rule out that the other areas are unaffected and don't need to be treated. So you want to have data that shows that before you don't treat those areas. Um, mycotoxin contaminations uh, are almost always whole home treatment given the nature of mycotoxins and how small and uh, they get. So uh, the only exception to that is going to be a structure that is extremely large that has multiple air handlers and we can break the property down into zones. But that's really the exception and not the rule. Um, there's an interesting uh, study that's that's below. And again, Dr. Uh, Brewer mentioned the biomass. Uh, the biomass, which is the shell of the spore, it's a beta-glucan. It's a non-viable particle which can act as a carrier mechanism for mycotoxins. Uh, these mold spore shells biodegrade into fine particulates having a size of less than one micron. And as fungi and mold release the spores in the beta-glucans, during the winter months, these components may enter into the um, HVAC filter, uh, the heating system of the structure. Uh, and once the mold spore or beta-glucan carrying a mycotoxin passes through high temperatures, the mycotoxin may become vaporized, turning into a gas that may be inhaled by the occupants of the structure. So that's one of the reasons why you don't just spot treat typically a, um, uh, a home that has elevated mycotoxins. Um, so when a remediation scope is being developed, uh, these factors will be considered and the remediation should be right sized for the maximum efficacy for the client and their recovery at the lowest cost possible. Um, as a remediator, you never want to over treat because then you're wasting your customer's money. And you certainly don't want to under treat because then we're not going to be efficacious and get the client where they need to be. Um, address settled spores through filtration and surface treatment. Uh, vegetative growth may require discarding the item or uh, if it's framing material like two by fours or floor joists, uh, those items get abraded, uh, uh, hopefully with a OPA attached sander or wire brush to minimize aerosolizing particulates. Um, but uh, uh, as we mentioned, drywall may need to be removed. So again, uh, keys to successful remediation. It begins and ends with a good inspection. Um, very important. Um, setting the proper expectation with the client. We've learned over the years from working with patients who suffer from, you know, perhaps brain frog or other conditions is that we have to really over communicate uh, timelines, client responsibilities, uh, expected outcomes, uh, what needs to be treated, what needs to be discarded when they can return to their home. We want to communicate that to them verbally as well as provide um, uh, written communication and email afterwards. A comprehensive remediation plan should include the following. It's got to ensure that all the moisture issues are resolved, that proper containment and engineering controls uh, are put into place when they're required. That's going to be when there's a mechanical disturbance because we make it worse before it gets better. Uh, the removal and disposal of materials which cannot be effectively treated. The abrasion of framing materials and surface treatment thereafter. Uh, addressing the HVAC systems, the lungs of the house, uh, very important. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, with our clients, duct cleaning and sanitization, et cetera. How to treat indoor air quality, whether that's um, it's the airborne contaminants, whether that's through atomizations or the use of air scrubbers or negative air. Surface treatments of all the walls, ceilings, furniture, personal belongings where those settled spores will land. And then, um, of course, filtration, whether it's going to be critical vacuums or HEPA filtration as well. And the last thing is post testing. That's a must. Uh, we think we're fairly decent at, at what we do for our clients. We do a pretty good job, but we're not always 100% the first time. And so uh, post-testing is critical to come. Uh, oftentimes we have to come back or occasionally we have to come back and retreat a structure. Um, we get colonies that are a little more stubborn or perhaps a moisture issue that wasn't identified by the inspector. So post-testing we highly recommend. Um, enzymes versus biocide, I'll, I'll wrap up with this slide. Um, I think of the use of enzymes and remediations about the same as I do with PCR testing. I think it's the next generation. And I won't go into great detail. We don't have that much time. Uh, but there's been plenty of studies which show uh, the efficacy of enzymes on biotransforming or biodegrading mycotoxins. Uh, you can go to PubMed, and uh, it's a great resource. Uh, search biotransformation of mycotoxins. You'll, you'll find a study uh, by an Italian university which uh, 
defines biotransformation as the degradation of mycotoxins into non-toxic metabolites by using bacterial, fungi, or enzymes. Um, and it shows the efficacy of enzymes biotransforming aflatoxins, okratoxins, uh, fusarium-based uh, uh, mycotoxins, trichothecenes, et cetera. Biomen is an Australia, Austri Austrian company, there we go, uh, that received EU approval uh, to add enzyme sets, proprietary enzyme sets, into the feed industry. I think uh, uh, Dr. Krista mentioned uh, um, mycotoxins in our, in our food sources, and so Biomen has been using enzymes for years to treat mycotoxins, um, and they define it as uh, nature's catalyst, that they harness uh, enzymes for mycotoxin remediation and safe animal nutrition, very important. And our own Dr. Hooper uh, conducted a um, analysis in 2018 on our Surface Guard product, uh, which shows uh, uh, efficacy breaking down up to parts per billion of mycotoxins um, uh, in the gliotoxin group, aflatoxins, ochratoxins, and trichothecenes, uh, to where there was none present after day one and continued through day 365. So we think that enzymes provide a much better remediation as opposed to traditional biocide for those that have um, environmental illness. So very good. My time is up. Um, I know there's a lot of information to cover. Matt, I don't know if we have time for any Q&A, but it's certainly uh, willing to stick around if that's, if, that's, uh, if that's okay and fits within the schedule. Matt? Okay, I hear that we have some chat questions. So uh, let's try to get some of those um, addressed. Uh, Matt, can you hear me? I can hear you, can you hear me? Uh, there you go, all right, perfect. Um, any particular questions that uh, we should nail down? I mean, I think that you hit a lot of multiple ones in the chat. I mean, you are more than welcome. Do you want me to pick some for you, or would you like to do it for you? Um, you know, either way, I'm trying to get there. Bear with me. I have three monitors, up, so I'm I'm as confused as I could get. Yeah, okay, uh, I'll, 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 I can let's see here. Let me try to get the beginning of your talk here. Is that going to be on the stage? Yeah, it's on the stage. Okay, um, uh, Dr. Flores, I see uh, the question. Thoughts on using oz uh, on patients using ozone in their space while not at home? Um, you know, I get this question quite a bit. Um, I, ozone can be effective. We particularly don't use it. Uh, we know that uh, uh, ozone is, is not great for uh, uh, inhabitants of, of a structure. Obviously, you don't want them being there if they are going to use it. Uh, we, we think that there's other ways that may be a little more eco-friendly that will get us uh, the desired result. Uh, so I, I don't particularly use ozone. It's commonly used in the industry, however. And there's a question from Laura that says, what do you tell people with dirt crawl spaces, especially when they're experiencing systematic inflammation? Yeah. So crawl spaces, I would probably say 90% of the crawl spaces that we get into wind up having issues. Uh, we have stack effect. Um, the, the short answer is that the crawl space needs to be encapsulated with a, a vapor barrier. Uh, we recommend a, a 12 mil poly that extends up the, uh, the foundation wall to just below the rim plate. Um, hydrostatic pressure will push water into that crawl space and then that moisture is going to evaporate and where does it go? It goes into the decking and the floor joists, which is a food source. So uh, that has to be addressed. Uh, and it's, it's oftentimes um, uh, really hot spots for folks that have environmental illness. Um, John, so Tracy has a question. 
Are you familiar with the testing that immunolytics is doing with gravity plates? And if so, can you please share your opinion? Yeah, so similar to auger plates, uh, immunolytics, I, I know, um, and there, there are some um, healthcare providers we do work for that uh, will have clients um, uh, use those gravity plates or auger plates. Not, we don't use them a great deal uh, because not all molds will culture well, uh, and they have a bias to um, uh, xerophilic molds, right? So we can have a bunch of stacky, but it's not going to aerosolize and lay inside that plate. So, um, you know, I, I, I say, hey, put out a, a slice of white, then you can get mold going on it pretty quick if there's enough humidity that's there. Um, I think there are other testing methodologies that, that, that we would use over an auger plate, but we do use them if we want to understand if there's living spores. Uh, before we answer a couple more questions, let me uh, give a little bit of update on what's going on tomorrow. So sure. I want to apologize to the issues that we had with um, Dr. Nathan's talks this morning. I think yeah, that's what evidence that sometimes you can't like have like a, a computer can be too old sometimes. So well, the way that we're going to work around this is that Dr. Nathan and I are going to burn the midnight oil and we're going to record both of his talks tonight um using zoom and then i can like play to hit the, the zoom calls over our um over our platform here so we'll play his cell danger response at the nine o'clock central time which we were he is scheduled tomorrow then for our first talk, that was going to be marker our, uh, which was going to be the overview overview of mold treatment. We'll do that at about uh, five o'clock central hour after my mycotoxins effects on fertility talk. So, and again, both of those talks will be on the website that we share with all the attendees um, after we have all the talks put together and. Um, available for view viewing so you can either watch them both tomorrow or you can watch them later after we um, get the um, all the like files put together for the videos and get them edited so we're gonna give you some like um flexibility on that okay let's get back to answering some questions uh you want you got one john yeah, so uh, someone called out. It's a great call out on uh, using IR uh, cameras. I know uh, Max McCord and uh, Irv Crowd, who who actually works with us. Irv's our uh, staff certified industrial hygienist. Um, you use an infrared thermal camera to look for thermal anomalies inside of a structure. Water heats and cools differently than what air does. And so uh, you find the anomaly and then you use a moisture meter. Uh, we use uh, uh, FLIR uh, infra uh, infrared uh, moisture meters to measure the moisture content of the building material. Because it's not always a moisture issue. It could be uh, perhaps um, an insulation void or something along those lines. So uh, that's, a, that's a great question on the use of IR cameras. I'm trying to see if there's anything else. Man, I don't. Um, here's a, are portable air filtration units helpful and which type is best for mycotoxins? Any yeah. Thoughts? Yeah. So, uh, I'll tell you what I, what I, what I do. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, the EPA recommends, uh, using, uh, high efficiency, uh, HVAC filters, a MERV 13 or MERV 16. Um, and so, uh, if we start out from DeNova, we have ducts clean and we don't have a lot of particulate matter. I think the HVAC is, is overall the, the, um, with good filtration is, is probably your best line of defense. I use a, a HEPA rated system in, um, uh, in my bedroom. I have a, a, a HEPA system I've had forever. It has charcoal filtration on there, which helps out with any odors. Um, I don't know of a brand that I would recommend per se. There's a lot of good ones on the market. Um, I, we can break down IEQ machines into two categories, either purifiers or filtration devices. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of, of um, technology which zaps particulate matter and breaks it down further. 
because as we talked about inhalation risk, I don't want to zap particulate matter and make it even finer particulate matter. I'm a big fan of using uh, HEPA um, IEQ machines. That way I can remove the filtering media and dispose of it and put a fresh fresh one in. That's that's what I use for, for, the, for the Bodie household. Okay, well, I think that was a very long day for all of us, and I appreciate everyone. We still got 65 people logged in right now, and I really appreciate all of you sticking with us for the whole day. So, so tomorrow we'll do the welcome address at 6:50 a.m. Central Time. So, uh, we uh, happy to see everybody then. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. <laughs>